It has been over a week since Starship's Flight Test 3, and since then we've had loads of opportunity to analyse more of that groundbreaking flight. What about Flight Test 4 coming up though? Yes, I've already got updates on that as we watch SpaceX rip back into action to prepare for all that madness. Along with that though, it has been super busy outside Starship development in Texas, so hold on tight because we have got yet another gigantic week. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Hey hey, Mark S. House with you here, and today this is going to be a fun one because we've got so much to talk about as we dive deeper into the detail around the incredible Starship Flight Test 3. First though, let's just catch up on the work that has been going on in the aftermath of that. Here we were back at the Gateway to Mars to check out how well the launch pad and the infrastructure survived. Starship Gazer was out in the dunes not long after the road opened back up to catch these images. The orbital launch mount definitely looks a little toastier compared to the the day before, but we think overall this is still in great shape. The same story for the tower base too. Yes, those new stainless steel cladding sections that they installed used to be light grey, and they've now got a nice coating there from the intense 33 Raptor plume. Again though, they look to be in great shape. There's no warping or damage that we can see, so that was a great addition to prevent the concrete of the tower base from being damaged or just eaten away. Given that these photos were taken only around three hours after the launch, the pad really does look to be in good condition. Well, apart maybe from what looks to be some minor warping there on the booster quick disconnect hood, but that perhaps could be the perspective there tricking us from this angle. Anyway, compared to the chaos that we saw after Flight 1, I wouldn't have believed that the world's most powerful rocket launched from here only hours earlier. The big question on everybody's mind though was if the flame deflector system survived the launch as nicely as it seemed to in Flight 2, and RGV aerial photography was up in the air in no time to find out. Now just take a look at this. There doesn't seem to be any cracks or anomalies in the concrete that I can see there at all. Although there is a cover over the steel plate in some areas so that debris doesn't make its way down into all the holes there, from what we can see it still looks perfectly intact. So much so that SpaceX were immediately back into the grind with this ship transport stand moving down to the launch site only six hours after liftoff. Trailing behind that was the launch mount work platform, which allows SpaceX to get up into the mount for inspection safely and without the need of any lifts. Scaffolding was already going up onto the top of the mount to allow for a safe environment for inspection. This is the one water tank that remains, and we can't really see any significant new dents or anything like that in the tank shell. From this we can conclude that the new bracing seems to have served its purpose quite well, but it doesn't mean that we were completely free from damage that will need some pretty big repairs though. Some of the walkways on the ship quick disconnect arm along with wiring on the tower arms took a beating. I imagine SpaceX will add some more shielding to these parts to protect them from the booster's exhaust in the future, but right at the back of the booster quick disconnect connect though, as they removed part of the protective hood, we could see that one of the main hoses looked like it had been completely sheared off its solid attachments to the pipes on the launch mount. There will be some improvements needed here, and they immediately started setting up to remove them. Even with all of this though, the damage seemed superficial, so overall the launch site is still in really good condition. Moving over to the suborbital side of the site, which hopefully soon will be Orbital Pad B, the LR11000 crane woke back up, poking up into the low hanging clouds there. Sitting so close to the orbital pad there at launch, this is another great sign that Flight 3 didn't cause any infrastructure damage that we can immediately see, so that was a good sign that that was moving again so quickly. Now to aid in the repair work, the Raptor installation platform was moved over as well, and the name for this is slightly deceiving because they've used it in the past to gain easy access to the booster quick disconnect hood. It is indeed used for more than just replacing Raptor engines. Trailing behind that was one of the two point lifters for a ship, and that was a great piece of evidence to suggest that Ship 29 would be back here soon to continue with its engine testing campaign. Sure enough, it peaked outside of the high bay on Thursday afternoon and was soon rolling down to the launch complex overnight. By early Friday morning, it was hoisted up onto the suborbital pad to get ready for a static fire campaign, hopefully this coming week. Speaking of moving vehicles, we are finally saying goodbye to the old Booster 4. This was the very first one, by the way, to be stacked with Ship 20 in these iconic images from 2021. 
This was rolled into the mega bay with two remaining grid fins still attached as shown in this great shot by Sean with NASA Spaceflight. They must have had some issues taking those off, but yeah, since then it has been unceremoniously sliced in two with the bottom half rolling out to be sliced up further. I guess it couldn't stay around forever. Ok, so we have got some really interesting stuff to talk about here with Flight Test 3 and so many of you had some great questions, so thank you for sending them in and keep them coming. Many of you asked how SpaceX would be able to launch a ship with a payload given that the ship was appearing to be almost completely out of propellant at engine cutoff. Well, if we actually compare the frost line of Ship 28 with Ship 25, there's actually a fairly clear difference. This is speculation, but to me it seems that SpaceX had simply loaded less propellants into Ship 28 so that they wouldn't then need to dump a huge load of it like they tried to in Flight 2, which ultimately led to fires and the destruction of the vehicle. The other big question of course on all of our minds was the missing attitude control that seemed to have the Starship slowly rotating in its near orbit. In fact, Starship 28 had started to roll faster the further that we got into the coast phase. Now, it does seem desirable to have a slow roll so that no specific part of the ship would be heated dramatically by the sun, so an initial spin up was fine, but it was obvious that they really lost control as it headed into the upper atmosphere as we began seeing the awesome re-entry plasma starting. Perkin here, assuming that is how you pronounce it, did a great job lining up the visuals of the ship to the actual orientation from this third person perspective. It was a little deceiving watching the camera view because it was mounted on the forward flap that moves back and forth. So yeah, you can see that the roll was actually quite stable and consistent until the atmosphere begins adding its influence to it. Now during the final few minutes of the coast phase we got to see a significant chunk of something floating away from the ship and given that it had been coasting in space for quite a while at this point, it seemed kind of weird didn't it? Looking closely at each piece there certainly looks like chunks of ice and whatnot mixed up in this, but it does indeed look like pieces of heat shield tile were in there as well. Now, we don't know where they were coming from. For the most part, the heat shield appeared to hold up pretty well, with a few missing tiles here and there in view, but not bad. I suspect what we actually saw there was something unexpected happening around the nose area. Perhaps some vents blasted a few away up there, but whatever it was, I'm sure that SpaceX is already fixing that issue for future ships. With the help of the amazing chameleon circuit this week though, I thought that it would be really useful to show some of the locations of the vents designed for the attitude control. Now, the three propellant settling vents right inside the aft skirt are here, and they do the job to provide a small thrust to let all the propellants settle in the tanks. Obviously during the flight there was a lot more venting going on, mainly from the engine chill process. Those are guided right to the end of the aft section, so just be careful not to mix up those two things. Now we have some other major vents that get overlooked, and that's because these are a fairly recent addition. Yes, SpaceX have got these two rather small small roll vents in the liquid oxygen tank, one for each direction to allow for roll corrections. Now, I never saw this one that is in view fired during the coast phase at all, and given that we got to see loads of venting from the aft section of the vehicle but nothing from here, yeah. That seemed weird. If this one here had been firing, it would have been helping to counteract the roll that we were actually seeing. But I think that SpaceX simply had a blocking or some issue of some sort with the control of that thruster, or perhaps the valve that leads to it. With all that amazing data and the video from both NASA's Tedris and the Starlink constellation, I'm sure that they have got a very good idea what happened here. I saw a lot of comments suggesting that the venting from the aft section of the ship was perhaps an issue. I don't think it was, at this stage at least. This was, I think, mainly coming from those propellant settling vents inside the skirt, and this isn't a brand new idea, just for Starship. You see this sort of thing all the time with ULA's Centaur upper stage as well. That's because with a very slight amount of thrust forwards, that ensures that all of the propellants nicely gather at the bottom of the tanks. Remember, as part of this demonstration mission, SpaceX were completing a propellant transfer demo, and also they had planned to relight an engine before that was aborted. Ok, so the big question that I'm sure that you're all asking is, when are we going to see Flight 4 happen so that we can witness SpaceX solve these problems? Well, exciting news on that too. More on that in just a moment, but first a huge thank you to Ground News supporting this video. I'm sure you've seen all the variations of this story all over the internet at this point. The giant SpaceX rocket blasts off in the most successful test launch yet. 
an event that I obviously think was incredible. Versions of this are everywhere, phrased and publicised in very different ways. I've been leaning on ground news to access diverse perspectives, verify my information and come to my own conclusions on the full story. You can check it out at ground.news Marcus, the link is below. Let's just look at this story on ground news. I can instantly access almost 200 articles published on it worldwide. There is included here the Ars Technica article and an amazing source that shares the successes and the recovery challenges that need to be overcome. You then have other sources like the South China Morning Post based out of Hong Kong that likes to highlight the losses. I appreciate that Grand News lets us read these kinds of sources right next to each other and provides context like how biased or credible their reporting practices are based on language analysis done by expert news monitoring organisations. You can do this for any story on any topic, and I've been following the SpaceX Starship story, of course. You know, every week if you skim down the comments, there will always be a list of people spreading negativity about the Starship program. Yes, at a time when we are all trying to make sense of a murky media landscape, especially around critical geopolitical issues, I find their platform incredibly useful. So go to ground.news slash Marcus to check it out. You can subscribe through my link for 40% off unlimited access, which is what I'm using. Check it out from the description below. Hello. Thank you, Ground News. So when will Flight 4 happen? Well, Gwen Shotwell at the Satellite Conference shared with us some nice detail around exactly that. She expects this to happen in around six weeks' time, adding that Flight 4 also won't be carrying any Starlink satellites. That makes sense because SpaceX hasn't been able to perform the in-space Raptor re-ignition yet, so I think it's fair to assume that we're most likely going to be getting another flight with a trajectory and a re-entry plan very close to that of Flight 3. But fear not, because it seems that SpaceX is also still very much hoping to perform another six launches this year. The plan is to feature satellites being deployed during at least some of those missions, as well as attempting the recovery of both stages. Now, immediately, you may assume that this would mean catching them out of the air, which is indeed a future goal, but there was no mention there of the word catching. So perhaps that might simply mean both stages landing softly in the ocean for some sort of retrieval. After all, if they damage the tower arms during a landing attempt without a second tower operating, they can't launch any more without a brand new set of arms. So yeah, what do you think? Now, if you want to hear a bunch more of this sort of talk, check out Fraser's chat with Scott and myself released just the other day. That was super fun, so thanks a bunch, Fraser, for organising that one. That is the third time that we've done that now, so if you aren't following Fraser Kane there, you know what to do. It's an amazing channel, so you won't regret subscribing there. And likewise, Scott Manley. A link to those are in the description. And also, thanks for those that reached out telling me that they've needed to resubscribe here again. We tend to get little bursts of comments like that every once in a while. It's weird, but you know what to do. The other big event this week was, of course, SpaceX's commercial resupply Mission 30, but this one has a twist to it. A few weeks back, you may have heard some hints about a new emergency egress system being installed and tested on the new crew tower that has been constructed at Space Launch Complex 40. Months back, we saw the addition of the new crew access arm, but we are, of course, awaiting the first crewed mission to be launched from here. The thing is, all of the necessary systems need to be fully tested out for crew safety, and they shared this footage of the brand new emergency chutes that will allow astronauts to get off the tower fast if there is an issue. Now, that there would be quite a ride, taking it seems only about 13 or 14 seconds to get from the top down to the bottom. This is all quite different from what we've seen in the past from Pad 39A. This is what they call a slide wire system using these baskets. This, by the way, is largely the same system that was used all the way back with the space shuttle missions. Each basket here could hold up to three people, and then a braking system catch net and drag chain would halt them at the bottom. I've got to say, the new red slide system here certainly seems to be simpler. Anyway, back to the mission, this was launching from this exact same pad. SpaceX shared images of the Dragon there after going vertical at Pad 40 for the very first time, so it was a great opportunity to test out the crew access arm with this vehicle before an actual crew Dragon mission. This mission here is completely autonomous, so no crew on board, and they were sending yet another load of cargo to the International Space Station as we finished off the countdown there. It was a terrific time of day to launch there in the afternoon, and there it rose rapidly up through through Max Q towards stage separation. On board this mission, we had the usual consumable supplies and what have you, but I always think the scientific payloads are the most interesting. On this mission, there is loads of new technologies, from 
plant growth to the monitoring of sea ice, instruments to automate 3D mapping, and to create nanoparticle solar cells. I've got links to all of this information here in the description, but some of the high resolution 3D scanning work I think is super interesting. Microgravity is the perfect way to test out great innovation work there. The work being done with plants is critical for future long-term missions where we want to be able to grow food and use plants to help convert CO2 to oxygen at the same time. Always a perfect partnership. Next, measuring the oceans and the sea ice with more accurate technology can give deeper insight into the climate models that we have. And I think that everybody can agree that work in the new solar cell technology will be critical to the next generation of solar arrays. In in particular, the new research around quantum dots, essentially tiny semiconductor spheres, may hold potential to convert sunlight into energy much more efficiently. So the mission itself went off like clockwork, of course. The booster was on another glorious trip back to landing zone one. And with that time of day, it is always a sweet action show watching it touch down. Greg Scott captured some ripper shots of that too. Check that out. Nice work, mate. Right after, there we were watching the dragon separate and drift away on towards its mission. This time, from the perspective of dragon itself, looking back at the booster, which isn't the usual view that we get to see, so that was a nice surprise. It's going to be up at the station for about a month before it is sent back to Earth with cargo and science experiments. We had another big week of Starlink flights too, of course. My video last week was put live a day early due to Starship's third flight test, but the next day, the Starlink Group 644 mission was launching. Yet another 23 V2 minis on board, and downrange at the drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas was standing by for touchdown. You're not bored of these drone ship landings yet, are you? I mean, yeah, they happen a lot now, but every one of these is still spectacular to me. SpaceX are now up to their 295th recovery or something like that, so in a few weeks, they'll have broken 300 of these. This booster, by the way, number 1062, is now tied as an active flight leader with 19 flights. The other active flight leader booster 1061 one also has 19, and the NASA Worm branded logo 1058 had flown 19 times too, but then broke in half on the way home. So there's just the two active flight leaders now. That was not the end of the Starlink action for the week though, because we had the Group 716 mission launching with Booster 1075 from Vandenberg early this week as well. Now, I've got to say, the atmospheric shots that we predicted for this flight were absolutely amazing as the sun was setting. Always beautiful scenes at this time of day from California. The rocket quickly passed through Max-Q there, and after main engine cutoff, just as predicted, check out this wonderful ground perspective from Max here, showing the second stage there rocketing away, and Booster 1075 turning around for its return. Now, what was also interesting about this mission is that normally we will see a shot of the Starlink stack at fairing deploy, but not for this flight. We're wondering if there was actually more than just the standard Starlink version 2 minis on board. Interestingly, SpaceX said that they were launching 22. However, the eagle-eyed out there, such as Jonathan McDowell, could only see 20 via the records with Celestrack. Normally, they would launch 22 from Vandenberg, so we were actually wondering if there may have been another two on board hidden as Starshield. That, by the way, is, as far as we know, essentially Starlink with modifications, owned by the US government and controlled by the Department of Defense. Obviously, this is all purely speculative, but I will say, though, it was odd that afterwards SpaceX removed the number of satellites shown in their website article, as pointed out by Alex from NSF. Curious, huh? Anyway, the booster followed its ballistic trajectory, continuing down to the drone ship, of course, I still love you, just as the last rays of sunlight were disappearing over the horizon. Interestingly, SpaceX has finally received a conditional FCC approval to use the E-band frequencies that they had applied for a long time back in order to enhance the capability of the network. That is going to apply to 7,500 of the Generation 2 satellites, which I suspect includes the existing V2 minis in orbit right now, which I think is around 1,900 or so. This approval allows for higher frequency communications between the satellites and the ground stations. With the higher frequency, you can pump much faster bandwidth, and specifically, they are allowed to now use frequencies between 71 and 76 gigahertz from space to the ground, and 81 to 86 gigahertz in the opposite direction. Now, I did say conditional FCC approval, and that is because SpaceX plans for a total of 30,000 
Gen 2 satellites, not just the 7500. For now, the decision to allow those frequencies for the full set has been deferred. Now, I feel like we're almost getting weekly awesomeness from Sierra Space. Last week I mentioned the vibration testing that the Dream Chaser Tenacity vehicle had been going through, but the next stop for Tenacity was the Thermal Vacuum Chamber, where it is tested against the extremes of outer space, from pressure drops and increases to thermal tests with those varying extremes. With these being completed, Sierra Space and NASA will conclude its test campaign, and it is then to be finally shipped to Kennedy Space Center to get ready for launch. I cannot wait. I do love this photo too. At first glance, it almost looks like the wing design has changed compared to what we are used to seeing, but in fact, this is just a less common angle that the camera's perspective was viewing it from. Now, we were also back again for more Rocket Lab action. That is two launches in just two weeks, and this was the fourth mission of the year, Live and Let Fly. In the early hours of Thursday morning, off it launched. Not from New Zealand though, no, we were back here at Launch Complex 2 at NASA's Wallops Flight Facility. This mission, NROL-123, is actually the first mission where Rocket Lab's US launch pad was used by the National Reconnaissance Office. With the specifics of the mission all locked up and classified, we didn't get to see the views of the payload itself. It was a mission surrounded in darkness. Yes, Rocket Lab went stealth with this one, a payload having a secret rendezvous perhaps, shrouded in the cloak of night. Anyway, alongside that, they are making notable progress on their next generation neutron rocket. CEO Peter Beck said that they were planning to complete their Stennis test stand by the end of March, and following that, kicking off test fires of their new Archimedes engine soon after. If indeed Rocket Lab can tick off their plans between now and the first test flight, Neutron could potentially be launching by the end of this year. That is a big if, I suspect, but optimism for the win, you don't know if you don't try. So that is yet another week done and dusted, my friends. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe so we get to keep making them. If you want to continue with more space goodness, check out this video right here, or maybe these videos. Thank you for watching all this way through. That makes a huge difference. I'll catch you in the next video.